G'day, Nathan. How are you doing? Uh, good, Michael. How are you going there? I'm um, very well. Now, it, I noticed that in the financial review, there's a bit of talk about overzealous regulators. Have you cited any of these overzealous regulators in your travels uh, uh, over recent times? I must say, Michael, in sort of like two decades of investigative journalism, I haven't managed to track one down yet. But, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can keep looking, I guess. Um, certainly, ASIC's been fairly zealous in managing, um, you know, relocation packages for executives and, um, you know, assisting with their executives' tax affairs and things like that. But as, as far as overzealous record, regulators go, I think the closest thing we've got in Australia is probably Austrac that actually is doing its job. And, uh, you know, in doing so, it's really showing up APRA and ASIC and far better resourced regulators for the, um, you know, really the, the disappointments that they are to most Australians. Have you, have you come across an overzealous regulator well, I, in the I travels? I think overzealous regulator, I think they're probably rarer than the Tasmanian tiger mate aren't they the overzealous regulator very very uh, rare species uh, maybe Austrac as you say they've been doing a bit of good work Westpac and so on tell me um, yeah. what are they up to yeah. I believe you've got a little I, I think ASIC, we'll call ASIC from region. now on the corporate the corporate thylacine indeed indeed now now what are they up to have you, have they got another um, uh, mark in their crosshairs at the moment Austrac Austrac have, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, on the subject of effective regulators doing their job with um, finite budgets and challenging conditions, uh, a story we're working on at the moment is Austrac's next target, which you're going to find this hard to believe, but uh, cash converters, a listed franchise of, uh, you know, pawnbrokers, uh, you know, acting as cover for really a payday lender has found itself in Austrac's crosshairs. And it's a really interesting situation because, you know, these, these pawnbroking firms are lenders under the AML Act and therefore they have to have all of their ducks in a row, you know. Uh, so we've had a confirmation late this week from Austrac that it is doing an enforcement case into cash converters. And it's going to be really interesting to watch this play out because Cash Converters is listed and yet it runs a franchise model. So the responsibility for anti-money laundering controls falls upon head office as well as the individual franchisees. And there's some um, very interesting things going on there. And from our research, there's some pretty woefully inadequate compliance programs across the organisation. So I think this is going to be a big one. Uh, and it certainly cuts to a pretty, you know, a pretty important area of the, the economy, which is, you know, there's been allegations for a long time that um, pawn shops act as um, fronts for fencing stolen goods. We're all familiar with that um, um, so, so, suggestion. So the, the nature right. of, of the story then is rampant, is, uh, is allegations of rampant money laundering by cash converters, franchises. Uh, so we've got to bear in mind Austrac's picking them up for failure to prevent and detect and report money no, laundering. So um, they, 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 they get you for your controls. Um, if there's actual money laundering taking place, and that's a police, a criminal matter. But, you know, you can imagine when you're issuing loans uh, and then those loans are being paid back, you're very vulnerable to, um, you know, uh, being being misused by criminal groups that can uh, take out a loan and then wash their criminal funds by paying that loan back. So yeah, it's a, it's a serious area and it's going to be a very fascinating one to watch because Austrac, after a 1.3 penalty against Westpac and prior to that 700 million against CBA, it's the regulator to to fear in Australia at the moment. It's sort of um, uh, you know the 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 little caboose that could, in a sense, of regulation. Indeed. So you're saying, are you alleging that, that the, the people don't fear ASIC and, and APRA and the ACCC? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there's a great story um, that I've heard from the UK where back in the day with the Bank of England, they called it T and, T and Vicky's regulation because when you'd go in for your visit with the Bank of England, if you'd been a naughty banker, 
they wouldn't give you biscuits with your tea. And that was quite literally a symbol that, you know, you, you've got to lift up your game here. So tell me what's the latest on the, the greatest regulatory um, legislative dithering in Australian history, the introduction of the second tranche of the AML, the Anti-Money Laundering Counter-Terrorism Financing Bill. Is it, it almost, it almost got there, didn't it? It's, it's back like Lazarus, you know, uh, it, it keeps returning almost from the grave. It sort of um, lunges up with its hand. Uh, so we've seen it back now. So basically there's some legislation that after a year of languishing in the lower house has passed, it's gone to the Senate. It's called phase 1.5 legislation, which is sort of a um, stepping stone to the genuine reform, which is bringing in lawyers, accountants and real estate agents and high value goods dealers and trust and company service providers, as we promised now for uh, 14 years internationally. And uh, the Greens have done something, it's, it's an act of political cunning that I think is almost worthy of the two major parties. So Senator Nick McKim, who, uh, you know, ironically, he used to be a um, tour guide in Tasmania, um, running environmental tours. So perhaps he's good at hunting thylacines, Michael. But um, he has tagged on a, um, a motion in the Senate to stitch a tranche two obligation onto this phase 1.5 law. Now, what that will do is it'll force the issue back into the lower house if he can get support from Labor. And then the current government will have to justify its position. And if it wants to get this bill through, it's got to commit to pass the tranche two legislation in 2021. So it's a really interesting uh, political move and it's brought this, uh, you know, waiting for Godot type legislation back onto the front pages, which is fantastic because it's critically important legislation for a country like Australia that wants to be seen as a clean place to do business and a low corruption economy. So you're saying that if they expedite this process, it could be done mm -hmm. as quickly as 15 years after it was originally slated to be introduced. Is Best case years? scenario. If Best no. case scenario, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's almost the time it takes to raise a child to adulthood to get legislation passed in Australia that might impair house prices. So, you know, we must be patient here, Michael, but I'm confident that it will get its run. Um, and once it does, I'm not sure what I'm going to do because this, this uh, you know, recalcitrant legislation has kept me busy for 14 years. Um, so let's hope it doesn't pass too quickly, right? Well, I, of course, ring every every year or so to find out how it's going. And it's always in eternal stakeholder consultation. You know, we can only imagine who the stakeholders are, you know, the property the property lobby, the, uh, the big four accountants lobby, and the lawyers lobby, of course, because they're all exempt from money laundering and counterterrorism financing laws at the moment, aren't they? Very powerful lobbies, those three. Yeah. Um, and I can't see how in good conscience people like the Law Council and so on can actually argue against it, but they, they do to protect their members. Actually, I'd like to ask you, mate, uh, the one thing I read on your site this week was fascinating. Um, I believe Michael West Media has made a takeover bid for News Corp. Um, and I saw the documents. Is, is this true? Have you put a... Uh, um, you know, a, a proposition to the board to become uh, the owner of those stranded assets? We have. We're awaiting. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're in breach of their continuous disclosure uh, obligations, uh, Nathan, but uh, we're still waiting for an answer from the board because we've, we've sent them a letter, sent Rupert, who's the chairman, News Corporation, a letter and his directors saying that we're prepared to offer, not for the whole company, but for the Australian we saw the accounts, the financial statements, the 2020 financial statements of News Australia Holdings. And we had, were looking at those this week. And we felt a bit sorry for them, really, because their revenue is still falling and their assets still falling. They look like they're actually negative assets. So we decided that they needed a little, you know, there was potential for a turnaround because if we had a radical restructuring and just basically required all journalists uh, at News Corp to, uh, to tell the truth, then um, the fortunes of this news 
Leviathan might suddenly be revived, but we'd have to get rid of all that old dead wood at the top, of course. So we've pitched a one for one offer for 97 odd billion uh, shares, which the three shareholders of the Australian entity, the three offshore shareholders uh, own 97 billion shares, one for one. But of course, in Rupert's in tradition too, uh, following his tradition, we, we're setting up a special purpose vehicle, but the shares that we're going to be offering in the new co, they won't be paying a, a dividend, of course, because you know, new shareholders are used to not really getting much of a dividend. And of course, they won't be voting stock either. There'll be non-voting shares. Uh, so we're quite proud of our bid, but we haven't heard back from them yet. And uh, if they do say yes, uh, we, might, uh, we might just have to march in there and give the place a good restructuring. Certainly, there would be no need for a Royal Commission. <laughs> saving the, uh, you know, saving the Australian community tens of millions, but depriving uh, Royal Commission lawyers of tens of millions at the same time. So as with Tranche 2, Michael, um, I wish you the best, but you are up against some significant lobbying forces on that it's one. A bad day for the lawyers. Another thing that I've come across this week, Michael, um, seeing that you've got your um, pork shirt on there, um, Gladys Berejiklian has said that, you know, the kinds of activities that we've seen in New South Wales lately, the pork barrelling is normal conduct in politics. Are you familiar with that one? Have you followed that piece? Well, I mean, shredding's become fairly normal. Shredding of the, the, the government's shredding documents and now saying the pork barrelling sort of bribing uh, people for votes is, um, is all kosher. So they've, I suppose you've got to give her points for honesty, haven't you? Because for them, it is normal behaviour and for the, the federal government as well, both sides of politics. Um, but what she's really saying is that corruption is now, she's normalising it. She's saying it's okay. Corruption is good. Like greed is good back from the, the Wall Street movie days. Corruption is good. Corruption is part of the political process. Uh, it's normalised because, you know, she's doing me out of a, a trade because I'm trying to sell these T-shirts to, to draw awareness to the fact that corruption is rampant in Australian <laughs> politics, absolutely rampant. And it's undermining the very fabric of the society we live in. Uh, but of course, she's just come out and said, it's, it's just de rigueur. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I found it astounding, as you say, it normalizes conduct. So, um, you know, pork barreling is on the fringes of corruption. Um, she points out that it's lawful. Uh, there's nothing, nothing unlawful about it. But as you say, it, it sort of realigns the political expectations around what we should, you know, what we should expect in terms of the conduct of our politicians and the level of political influence and the ability for, you know, corporate Australia to influence policy. So uh, I, I thought it was profound. Uh, I do, like you, I do applaud her honesty. I guess she's learned something over the past few weeks about being up front, but it's a, it's a certainly a worrying precedent. But it would be ironic, Michael, if now that pork barrelling has been normalised, that we see people in Canberra um, cruising around the corridors of power wearing your shirts. That would be a nice outcome. <laughs> well, I certainly hope so, because we need to finance independent journalism somehow, Nathan. But look... Thanks for, for coming on the show. Hope you have a terrific week and we'll be awaiting your cash converters scoop with uh, great anticipation. Should be a good one. Fantastic, Michael. Keep up, keep up the great work. Uh, always, a, always a joy and a delight reading your site and uh, um, onwards and upwards. Cheers, buddy.